a really uh, dear friend of mine, David Newman, sent me a statement the other day that I gravitated to very quickly. Uh, it's from his teacher, Neem Karoli Baba. And his teacher said, it is better to see God in everything than to try to figure things out. Some of you have problems with the idea of God, and I understand that. Certainly as a overseer or a giver of gifts and punishments and judge and all of those things that religion tends to uh, present us with. And I certainly understand those of you who prefer consciousness, presence, so many different words to describe something impersonal. <clears throat> but I, I really have this very strong feeling that seeing the divine God, presence, love, energy, consciousness in everything is better than being at war with everything or being in intellectual conflict with everything or trying to arrive at some place that makes you understand what this all is and create so much tension and drama in daily life. There's just something helpful in seeing if you will, a conscious presence always here. Now, yes, it is hard for the mind to grasp what that means because we have so much that we like and don't like, so much that is good and so much that is clearly evil. There is lightness and darkness and we do not know through the mind how to put that together into something we would celebrate or that we would embrace. And yet, in a way, it's not looking for our celebration and our embrace. It's looking for our awareness of it, our ability to witness in all things. It doesn't say like it or don't like it. In fact, the real meditative act is to get beyond liking and not liking, or as I've been putting it in recent teachings, beyond reacting, beyond embracing the thing that is right and getting rid of the thing that's wrong emotionally, getting upset about this, getting joyful about that. That tends to create a very strong egocentric interaction with the world that brings us into states of stress, anxiety, fear, unhappiness and conflict, as well as moments of real happiness, joy, and gratitude. But the movement between those tends to give us a preference. And most of us really prefer happiness, gratitude, joy, etc. There are those who really prefer anger, stress, hostility, drama. And it's not hard to witness the presence of all of those things in our world, they are happening all the time. And now that the world is so connected, so full of social media, we get to witness this unseen, unspoken in a way, part of our psyche arising into the public mind and personal mind. And it's very hard to watch. It creates a lot of pull one way or another and struggle. And when we get into an experience like we've all been in and are still in, like this pandemic where we are all pulled together into the same boat and yet witness the enormity of differences in how we relate to that. But we have all had an opportunity to get quiet and to pull inside and to become aware and to witness the magnitude of something going on that is beyond our understanding and beyond our day-to-day -day experience. And it requires something from us that can manifest in many different ways, but in a sense, it requires a profound sense of surrendering to what is because fighting what is creates 
profound anger and hostility in the manifested world. So given a choice, I vote for being aware, being quiet, being observant, and being, if you will, non-reactive, just being present and witness the enormity of what we are all caught in, who knows how or why, but to see it all as God, rather than trying to figure it out, creates a kind of simplicity. It creates a kind of, this is all happening with the agreement of, or the control of, or the creation of something way beyond our ability to comprehend and understand. There's nothing wrong, wrong with trying to do that. Religion is basically a codification of an understanding that people have come to about what all this is. And then we can either agree or disagree with all of that, <clears throat> excuse me, which keeps us very much in the mindscape and ultimately is unresolvable. You cannot know, but you can arrive at this very interesting place when you surrender and let go of knowing, simply seeing consciousness, God, awareness, totality, just seeing it, witnessing it without knowledge, and in effect, letting go of understanding, letting go of knowing, something else happens. It is very centering. It is somewhat calming. And it is, when it finds a certain perspective, a point of unbelievable amazement, magical, mystical truth. It's a place of incredible gratitude, love, embrace. It's quite remarkable when you are not interacting with it or judging it or wanting it to be one way or another. When you simply go, uh, so it presents itself as it is, not as you want it, as it is. And in a way you are here, perhaps this is giving it context, but you are here just to observe it, to witness it, or as you become more and more liberated from your reaction to it, and you start to discover that the witness of it is the thing itself. It is that. The separation between the witness and the very massiveness that is manifesting it all is very, very slight. It is your role in all of this to observe. And if you are going to experience it as an experiencer, trying your best to feel the amazement and the awe that are at the core of it, rather than the re reaction of, than the programmed reaction to the ups and downs, the ins and outs, the things you like and the things you don't like that create your day-to-day -day mind and ego persona. Your suffering, our suffering, comes from ego mind. It comes from our sense of separateness from the what is. And learning to let go of that separateness is a effort over time configuration. So you keep practicing every day a little bit, let go, let go, take a breath, ask for help to let go. And it's to let go actually with a kind of directionality. So it kind of goes inward. It's a deepening of your perception. It's a deepening of your awareness so that you're not out there engaging, grasping, pushing away, fearing, wanting, you just, okay. And you go deeper and deeper and deeper, depth over time, and you become increasingly aware of the witnessing power that you are. That's in a way the journey that we are on. Not a lot of people know that. We are a society, perhaps a world of an incredible imbalance. We are almost entirely 
devoted to the outside, to the manifestation. And the problem with the manifestation is that it's so engaging, so real in a way, so full of you know car driving and television and making a meal and loving people and hating people and going on all of these journeys in the world, you completely forget that there is an internal witness to the whole thing. And that that witness is an absolute balance to the outer. And if you are imbalanced, you are going to have a hard ride. And it's kind of built in. So most people have a hard ride, but this, you know, this wheel of life behind me is basically people on that ride and then a few people who Buddha tells us can get off the ride or at least step back and witness it as it is and not be caught in the hell and the heaven of worldly manifestation, which is tricky, really tricky. Blanche and I uh, had our first journey back into the world this last week. We took a trip to Washington, DC to see my son, Ari, to see Blanche's sister, uh, Rhoda, who was having her 85th birthday and to witness the world away from the simple and very calm reality of our home, from the relatively simple calm of our little village, Red Hook in upstate New York. So we, are, we were suddenly going back, literally driving back into manifested life as you in California have probably all experienced every day. But for us, it was new. For us, it was like, oh my God, yeah, the mask. We gotta put the mask on, take the mask off. Ari trained us on how to go out to dinner, which was mask on if someone is waiting on you, delivering food, asking you a question. And Ari has endless questions for the waiters. So our masks were on and off and on and off and on and off. And I'm going, oh my God. And some of the waiters cared and some of the waiters didn't care, but there was a new reality. The hotel we stayed in had no room service. It had no food service. It was just a room, literally. Nobody changed the towels. Nobody brought in more soap. No, it was just, here's a room. It didn't have any of the finesse or the quality of what life was like before, but it was a room and it was near Ari. And I would go out to get in line at Starbucks to get coffee in the morning. And we made breakfast in our little hotel room. And that was really sweet. We went into the world and it was really different than our house and the village of Red Hook. It was very dynamic and very active and people walking around with masks. And it was, it was very um, compelling to be in that space. And then to journey with the two people who are my biggest tests in life, uh, my son, Ari, forgive me, Ari, <laughs> but I have to work really hard not to react to who he is and how he behaves in life. He, he, is, he, is a, he is a great gift to me. And I, and I love him for it, but it's work. It's really work. I have to go, okay. I mean, if we go out to dinner, I mean, forgive me, but he has to try three or four different wines and then he rejects all, all of them and takes a, a, another one instead. And, I, and we have to go through that litany of, you know, this is what he does. And he has to tell the waiter why each one is really sweet or sour. I mean, he has a vocabulary for, for wine that I, is way beyond my vocabulary for anything. But it's his way. And I have to sit there and go, uh, so, and I do. I really do. And it really trains me. It's really good. My sister-in-law at 85 is, is really, really gotten old, has a lot of issues, a lot of issues. She's a hoarder. And my, my sister is a hoarder. And her house has literally nowhere to sit in the entire house, except that one chair at a little corner of a table where she eats, but the table is piled high with things, the couch is piled high. Everything, every room is just piled high with stuff that I don't fully understand. And I finally realized on our last day there that she was attached to everything in every one of those boxes. And I understood it. I understood her complexity. I understood her need to hold on to what she knew was real and true and part of her and that she couldn't let go. And when Blanche and I moved from 
California to, to upstate New York from two houses into a much smaller house, we had to let go of all this stuff. And I felt, I felt the, what it means to let go of stuff that defined you and was part of your life. And it was really hard. On the other hand, it was very liberating. But to be around Rhoda and have nowhere to be present in her life in a kind of sitting down together mode was really hard. It was really painful. And I looked at her and I said, we don't know people. We don't know anybody. We're all such complex configurations of being and we think we have a clue. And then you spend time, especially post pandemic with people you haven't seen in a while and a deeper reality comes through and you go, I have more work to do. I have to open to this person in a whole new way in a whole new level of embrace and acceptance and allowance. And you think I'm past that. And then you go, no, you're not past that. And then I'm gonna really personalize this because it's really important. We are more than we know. And what started happening for me on this trip, <clears throat> and I will share it with you because I think it's really important, is I've always had a narrative sense of my life, beginning, middle, end. I, the ending I don't know yet, but I always had a sense as a screenwriter that I would like to write a nice ending for my life. Something that adds up, something that has a kind of emotional coda and you sit back and go, that was a good life. That was sweet. That was really a nice, journey. And what's happening is the narrative of my life is evaporating. I, no one told me that could happen. No one, no one told me that happens to many people, I think, maybe, maybe not. But all I know is I cannot hold on to the story. I know it's all there. I know all the pieces. I know there was a good life that was led. And that one constant in it really is uh, family. I'm forgetting cousins. I'm, I mean, people are just kind of evaporating into the ether for me. And I'm looking at it and I'm going, <clears throat> huh, is this dementia? Is this Alzheimer's or is this enlightenment? I cannot tell you which one it is. And it may be any of the three. A good friend of mine's teacher who was a non-dualist teacher and had many, many students ended up having dementia. And I kept going, how is that possible? How can you be enlightened and awakened and non-dualist and aware of, of the oneness of all things and then have dementia? I still don't have an answer to it, except that in fact, I may be experiencing that. My wife may be experiencing that. And that'll be really interesting, two of us completely losing it together and trying to figure out what that means. But I know our memories are going. My particular narrative story just isn't adding up. And that's what's really interesting. You want things out of the programming of external narrative storytelling to add up happily ever after. We all want that. But I am really discovering it isn't doing that. It's just going to be what it is. Day to day to day, whatever happens, what arises. I may make choices to try to make things arise but as I think I've described to you, I've arrived at a point where I don't have any agenda really. I used to have agenda all the time that gave my day purpose and focus and direction. Now I don't. But I will tell you, when I wake up in the morning and I wake my wife up, I just feel so much love for Blanche. And I just love, as I've described, waking her up. Being in the bathroom together, having breakfast together, reading the newspaper together, drinking coffee together. And then figuring out now what? Blanche always has something to go to. I, I really don't. And I'm sort of making it up as I go along. But I don't know anymore what the direction is. I don't know what the purpose is. So I just go, okay. We built this wonderful room at the end of the house. We call it the sun room. And I can just go in there. And I call it a restorative space. I just sit down and I get quiet. And I go, and I'm restored. I can't tell you how or why, it just kind of works. It's indoor, outdoor room. It just magically is effective. And then I go up to my office and stuff starts to happen. Emails, things like that. Lunch happens, dinner happens. Blanche and I work together. We, we go for a walk occasionally. There's all of these wonderful things that arise and it's called life. But it doesn't have career. 
It doesn't have a huge dynamic that it always had, and it's not making sense very much anymore. It's not purposeful. It's kind of without purpose. It's just called breathing, being alive, witnessing, smelling, hearing, life. I spent 10 minutes waiting for a cardinal today to make its approach to a bird feeder outside our window. I never would have spent 10 minutes waiting for the cardinal, but I could see it doing all of this jockeying, trying to figure out when would the other birds leave? When will he have an opening? How close does he have to get? How far away? He, I could watch his, and I started feeling his mind and I'm going, I would never have done that. 10 minutes with a bird. It was the most incredible thing. It was so incredible. And I went, okay, that, that's, that's, what my, that's what my life is right now. And I bring this all up to you because I so don't understand anything anymore. And if there comes a point in the next weeks, months, or year, when I kind of completely confess to you that I've lost it and I have no idea anymore, and if I cannot articulate what I seem to be able still to articulate about this journey into nothing adding up, when I can't do that anymore, you guys are going to have to figure it out for yourself because I won't be here to give any perspective on any of it. The closest I think I'll come is we don't know anything. That's pretty simple. The other thing is probably, you know, this, this idea that God is in everything, so stop thinking about it. God is all there is. Life, this witnessing is all there is. So we go through the journey as though it has meaning and purpose and it arrives at some ending that puts it all together. And it may yet, it may, I may not be around to tell you if that's true. It may come together, but I don't know. My uh, YouTube algorithm has decided who I am. And it presents me all of these strange things that I guess you could extract certain parts of my life and give them to me as saying that's who you are. But recently it's decided I am a spiritual seeker. I don't know why, but all of these people are coming up online who are all talking about spiritual truth. And I don't listen to them a lot, but I turn on little pieces. And what I keep getting is really interesting. One is that they have the answer, that they know, that they, they have this extraordinary contextual idea with, with an amazing amount of certainty that this is how the spiritual journey goes. They may be completely right. One of their great sales pitches is that it will bring you permanent happiness or joy or bliss. I would buy that in a second. But the thing I have come to in my own journey, again, you don't have to trust me. You can just tap into the YouTubes of any of these guys and get what you want. But if you come to me, this is what I will tell you. I don't know. But I do know when everything starts to fall away, I experience two different sensations. One is terror and absolute despair at the loss of everything that ever was, which is real and part of this journey. And then a voice comes up inside me, which is the teacherly voice, and it says, who is despairing? Who is fearful? Very important directive and question. The second thing I experience is an overwhelming sense of love, joy and amazement at being alive. And they seem to be doing a dance. For people who tune in to my talks and hear about the despair, I can see, turn it off, <laughs> turn it off. I don't wanna go there. And I get it. You can turn this off. I have no problem with that. If you just wanna hear endless bliss, there are so many channels. And some of them will charge you a fortune to hear about them. And some will maybe not. This is free, so you can come and go as you wish. But I will tell you from what I'm experiencing, it starts to alter in remarkable ways. And that the sense of purpose and journey and completion and adding up to something may completely evade you. And if you can be practiced enough to go also, you will watch everything you know go away, except for the fact that you take a breath, 
Sun comes up in the morning, you walk outside and get the newspaper, you watch the cardinal coming into the bird feeder, you hug your partner or you hug not having a partner and be grateful that you're, you know, that you care about yourself. Life becomes this simple, simple thing until it's not. And what happens when it's all said and done, I don't know. I would kind of, <clears throat> I subscribe to this idea of accountability. I have a feeling this whole thing is not purposeless at all, that there is some kind of training ground to it. There's some kind of learning process. There's something going on here, <clears throat> whether it's about letting go of everything or whether it's becoming a better person or a kinder person, I don't know. But I will tell you, again, if I had to vote for it, <clears throat> kindness and goodness is a good path. Compassion, empathy is a good path. Not knowing anything, if you can just really surrender and not be fearful of that, is nice. If you are fearful of it, ask who's fearful. Learn that lesson. Learn what the outer parameters are of your ego mind because it's the ego mind that holds on to fear. And if you can possibly just stare it down, look at it and go, so, and accept that you're fearful, not that it goes away, but it's a different relationship. It's a different relationship. You are suddenly open to totality. You're open to goodness. You're open to the loss of goodness. You're open to everything. This is the ride we're on. It's the ride I'm on. You don't have to be on that ride, but I have a feeling <clears throat> certain commonalities exist or you wouldn't be listening to this. You can dismiss everything I'm saying and find much more erudite teachers who have all the answers. And I, I think, you know, I, I have no attachment at all to teaching or to telling the truth as an absolute. I can tell you the little bit of truth that I am experiencing in this journey. If it speaks to you, then I would implore you, spend your time not reacting, spend your time seeing God in everything, and then relax. That's it, simple, really simple. And if you don't wanna see God, just see consciousness or awareness, whatever works for you. But if you have a problem with God, ask, who, ask who's got that problem. You know, if you have a problem with <clears throat> anything I'm saying, <clears throat> ask who that is. And let me just finally kind of say that if the bliss occurs and the joy and the beauty, don't get attached to that. And if you do get attached to it, ask yourself who's attaching. Because attaching to joy, beauty, love, and all of that is as problematic as, a, as, as, a, as reacting to despair, uh, black hole of life, you know, the, the dark night of the soul. You don't wanna be caught by one or the other. It's just sit back and go, huh. The wonder of it all for me is that the being that wants to be appears. And it appears at every given moment. And all you have to do is realize it, recognize it, witness it, be it, and that's it, period. And my sense of that is there's a kind of like, wow, factor to it, like, wow. I mean, who would have gone to all the trouble to make this world what it is? Good and bad, light and dark, who? Why? I don't know, but boy, that keeps me going. Something decided to do this. And even if there's not a something, even if it just happened by itself, I don't care. I am in a state of amazement and I will share that amazement with you as long as I can. I will now tell you that it's not gonna add up to anything more than amazement. It's not going to add up to I was a good person or a bad person or the best or the worst or I should have done or I shouldn't have done. None of that. What it adds up to is what it is right now. And what is it? I don't know. But it's amazing. It is amazing. And we're in it for this moment. And we will not be in it, at least not in a material sense, a story narrative sense, for all that long. And a lot of us 
you know, your how old you are, are moving toward the end of it. You know, you can make that whatever you want, but I will tell you moment to moment with no agenda, keep your eyes open if you can. <laughs> I'm even losing a little bit of my vision in my right eye, so I'll keep my left eye open and really look at this, witness it and be aware <clears throat> that I am in a state of awe that it is at all. I am awed that it exists and that I get to <clears throat> touch it and know it and experience it or witness it. So that's it. That's all I have to say. Um, I will tell you I love you. I will tell you that I will show up, I guess, to keep doing this if you guys are there, even one or two of you. Um, and if you're not, <laughs> I'm telling you, it doesn't add up anyway. So, you know, it's all, it's all fine. So uh, if anyone has a question, I'm assuming we're not on mute anymore. So uh, probably never were. So uh, go for it. George, you appear to be the first. I don't know. I, I just were reflecting back on Rudy's teachings of if you keep doing this practice, eventually you're going to ripen and, and, and get somewhere. And also, he said, once after you have a realization, you have to surrender that because that's otherwise you get attached to everything. Yeah. You know, Rudy was an amazing teacher. And I can only tell you that I recognize that more every day that I don't know how I lucked into meeting him <clears throat> and meeting other people who studied with him. <clears throat> but I feel so unbelievably grateful that this guy came into my life or I stumbled into <clears throat> his life. I don't understand the variabilities of life. They seem to be so odd in how they all work. But having met Rudy, having met Blanche, having met you guys, I have kind of understood that there is a directive force that if you can surrender to and follow and listen to and be present with, it tends to lead, lead you in what I would call into uplift in life, into a kind of uprising energy. I don't make that a fact. I'm not gonna guarantee that, but that feels like what has happened to me in this lifetime. And I have, as I said many times, great gratitude for that. Without the, dark, without the darkness, there is no light. So you're, you're well, to understand that. That's, that's true. I will tell you, I don't like the darkness. It has been profoundly unsettling in recent time. And I think a lot of teachers don't want to go there. And I get that. It's very humbling to see as much despair as kind of can reveal itself. But if you can bear it, if you can witness it and not indulge it, which is a really hard thing I'm discovering, it has the reward of embracing totality. Totality is not just light. As you say, it also needs darkness. If you're going to embrace the whole, you got to go there. Or at least you're going to go there whether you want to or not. So you better figure out how to deal with it. And I'm going to teach the fact that you're going to have to deal with great joy and love and happiness. And you're going to have to deal with great loss and despair and emptiness and meaninglessness. It's all there. It's all there. And you can't by one without the other. And if you do, you're gonna suffer because they're gonna take it all away anyway. So I think, you know, and I, and maybe I'm wrong, they don't take it away, I don't know. But I can tell you, <clears throat> if it's as amazing as it is now, why should it get less amazing? I don't think it will, we'll see. I may not be around to tell you, but you'll find out for yourself. Anybody else? <laughs> too much of this stuff, I know. <laughs> uh, Wendy, is that a question or a goodbye? Yeah, it's a question. Um, I, I appreciate everything you said, really. Thank you so much for all that uh, wisdom and insight. The question is around when you ask yourself who is getting angry or who is fearful, is, is it more that you experience a disidentification with being that uh, energy or is it that you, you get an answer or is it that ego is the, just the answer and it just reminds you? Like, what's your experience with that? It's a good question. It's a good question. It's an awareness that happens. <clears throat> it sets up the boundary that says, this is who I am. And then it slowly relaxes that. And you realize it's not who you are. It's like if somebody is getting you angry and you take a breath and let it go and you're not angry anymore, 
You can ask who was it that got angry, but the fact is that breath and letting it go reveals the part of you that isn't angry. And that's much bigger and much more welcoming than the part that is angry. So rather than knowing and understanding, you just experience the non-anger, the letting go of the thing that at one point would have been programmed into the system. I, this is wrong. This is not how it should be. And you get tighter and, and, and you lock in. Letting that go is wonderful. Learning how to let that go is meditative. It's going inside. It's getting quiet and seeing the result. And then when you kind of mag magnify that into the really big stuff, you know, not just somebody did something to annoy you, but that life did something that you think is wildly unfair and you do the same thing, you can be back in your quietude and you don't understand it. Why, why are these people killed by police? Why are these horrible things happening in Ethiopia? Why is that? You just, rather than walk around in a state of despair and anger, you go, you know, everything is God. That's all I know. Thank you. You're welcome. Is that it? I want to ask a nice question. Hey, Bruce. Hi. hi. This is Penny. Hi. hi. Um, when, when you find yourself reveling in, you know, celebratory moments, I mean, like our president, you know, taking care of the world in a better way, or someone who's a brilliant scientist who's protecting us. If you find yourself reveling in it, can't you just let that expand and expand with abandon? And, and then the second part of the question is if these forces of evil are emerging, if, if you just accept it, then, then there's the fear that it may never change because you have to fight against it in order to see change. I think, <clears throat> Jenny, I think that is all in a way true. Um, the spiritual journey is trying to create a larger context for all of that. And if you personalize it into one, loving one thing and hating the other, you will lock yourself into a smaller space. You may become an activist. You may become an activist for good things. I, I would celebrate that. I think it's very real and very meaningful. But in terms of real liberation, you have to see that if you are totally in love with, with Joe Biden and, and, then, and you really hate Donald Trump, you are caught in a dynamic you know, that is going to create a lot of suffering for you, hope and misery. Not that that isn't necessarily part of the human equation, not that we aren't all here to, in a sense, experience that, but the lesson of spiritual evolution is to lighten up with that, to witness it, to see it. Yes, we're human. Yes, we should be active where we can be active, but you learn your lessons as you go. The last peace march I was on was one of the most interesting experiences because I found that I was never around more angry people than the people marching for peace. So I went, well, what is this? There's, they're furious. They're not, there's no peace there at all. And I stepped back. I just said, I'm not going to do that. When I was trying to turn over a police car in front of the Hilton Hotel, because Dean Rusk was speaking there, uh, and policemen came on horseback and slammed down, crushed the police car. They just missed my hand by about a tenth of a second. I could have lost my hand being angry at Dean Rusk speaking. That would have had a much longer and deeper impact on my life. So those lessons have come back to me as a kind of witness this. This is the world. It has always been the world. Yes, you can give your life for it, for fighting for goodness fighting for the right thing. I think that is celebrated by higher forces, if you will. But in a spiritual journey, you might be able to transcend even that. I don't know for a fact. I don't want to say that you're wrong in how you feel and what you believe. It is all noble in my mind. It's on the side of good and righteousness and kindness and empathy. I support that. I think most human beings are not capable of the real depth of the human journey into spirituality. I don't think most people are drawn to it, really. So the human version, the best human version of this <clears throat> is kindness, goodness, empathy, sympathy, action to do the right thing. 
That to me is very important. But if you want to go on a deeper, bigger, much more remarkable journey, surrender all that. It may not mean that you stop it, but you will come at it from a very different and much more knowledgeable place. Mm. Okay. Thank you. Dean. I wanted to, um, I think it was return back to Wendy's point. I can't help, but um, like I get caught up in like my understanding of my own wounds. And then when in fact four things around me kind of make me sad or I feel like I, I just want to get back to, I think your point was that we don't want to get caught up. Like when we ask who is suffering, you know, I feel like I've got this idea or deep knowledge of my own wounds. But then the idea I think you're saying is that, okay, go ahead, feel it, do whatever, but then become, let it, when it passes, understand that we are more, and then that it helps to get Look, you can you can you you can drink bourbon, you can take Xanax, you can <laughs> meditate. There are just lots of different versions of what one can do when one is dealing with one's deep wounds. But yeah. what one really wants is to be relieved of that. Yeah, if, yeah. If you get relieved of it through uh, manifested external things, you're going to become very reliant on those things uh, and probably sure. more reliant as it goes on because they're not going to work as well. They're going to, you know, you're going to have to take more bourbon, more Xanax, more whatever it is. If, if you can find this particular practice and you go inside and get quiet, it's going to take work. It's not necessarily easy, but if you do a little bit at a time, you will find when you sit down and you sit Half the time, you're, or maybe more, your wounds aren't even there. They're just not addressing you. They're just a bit in abeyance. And you can be in a very quiet space. When they arise, you have to watch what sets them off. Why do I react to them? How do I react to them? Where does that reaction take me? And then try this meditative thing. Take a breath and just go. I'm looking at the wound. I feel the wound. I feel the emotionality of the wound. And I'm just staring at it and just being quiet, non-reactive and watch what happens to that. And watch how it starts to dissipate and break up. If it doesn't, it doesn't, but in time it will. And then you realize you have a tool that will allow you to deal with very, very real depths of woundedness from this lifetime, maybe from other lifetimes if such a thing exists and there's a lot of work to do, but it's much better, I think, to do that work than to Xanax. And not that you shouldn't Xanax if you have to. You know, Rudy <laughs> said, if you have a headache, take an aspirin. Xanax exists in the world. And I'm saying, if you cannot get on top of your, of your wounds and your struggle and your pain, yeah, find help. <clears throat> find help. This is a kind of help that I have worked on for 50 years, and it's helpful. It works. Not only does it work, it's kind of awesome in what it really, really does. <laughs> but you won't know that if you don't do the work, which is Rudy's endless sort of mantra, do the work. But otherwise, I mean, you gotta do whatever you do to get through. But what I'm watching, my sister-in-law is a really good example. She doesn't have much time to live. She's, she's, in her eight, she's 85, she's got a tremor, she can barely eat, she can barely cook, losing weight, you know, hoards, hoards all this stuff. She's in a really bad place. She is totally unconscious of death, finality, and the fact that this stuff has any purpose at all. She is backing her way into darkness. Most people are doing that. If you can turn toward the thing that is in front of you, open yourself up to the truth of it, find a way through the work to go, okay, then you have a life that is open and alive and real as opposed to hidden and backed into all the way to the end. And I don't per personally want to back out that door. I think that is not a good road to go. On the other hand, it's the way most people go. I watch people, I sat in a restaurant the other night watching the people around me, nobody was conscious. 
nobody, everybody was and I went, when and how will they wake up? When and how will there be something that will go, I don't know, maybe not in this lifetime, maybe in a 500 lifetimes, I don't know. But I just watched it and I went, this is hard. This is hard. People are wounded. They are lost. They have no idea what this is. They build up worlds in their own mind. And then it all just kind of, in my experience, starts falling apart. And you go, what, what is that? What was that? And there's nothing, there's no center to even sit back in and say, aha, it was nothing. It meant nothing. It just was. And there's a kind of, for me, at least, a settling into simple awareness as opposed to backing into the insanity of everything falling apart and not knowing what is, who is, why is. That is not the simplest and best path. Not that I may not end up there. <laughs> you know, I yeah, cannot tell you. So I, may, I may be in line for that. So, so be it. So be it. I am going to go with, I'm going to go into that world with my eyes open and I will report from the front lines until I don't know how to speak anymore. Awesome. Thank you. I appreciate that. Anybody else? Okay. I love you guys. Uh, two weeks, I'll be back in the uh, in the West Coast and uh, stay well. Enjoy. I, I, I would say the heat, but I see a lot of you bundling up, so I don't know what's going on in, in Los Angeles. But uh, but anyway, stay well. I love you all, and thank you for for being. Here.